A practical prayer is a prayer that works. These discussions between Reverend Bill Marcioni and Carol Lawrence dive into the details of how it works and how to work it. Reverend Bill is a new thought minister and the author of Practical Prayer for Real Results. Your new life begins with a new thought. Carol Lawrence is on a spiritual quest, finding the new thought teaching after decades on the pulpit in three different traditional denominations. I've got some questions. Together, they're exploring the philosophy and activities that come together from many of the world's religions to create the practical spirituality that is new thought. Welcome to the Practical Prayer Podcast. I'm Carol Lawrence here with Reverend Dr. Bill Marcioni. And we always have great discussions, but I have something that I would like to talk about. You okay. are on. Cue so up. I want to talk about discipline. And I get a lot of flack about that, you know, because people think that I'm too disciplined. But I think you need to have, and by the way, I'm only disciplined in certain areas. I want to put that out there to the world. It's not everything, but it's certain things. And I'm just talking, people think you're yes. too disciplined. That's a critique and a criticism that you have, that somehow their life will be better if you're less Probably. disciplined. <laughs> what's up with that? What's, what's I, you up know, with that? I think <laughs> when people are insecure in an area, you know, they're like poking at you in the opposite. But mm -hmm. I don't like to push things on people, but I'm just simply saying that discipline is a tool that you use in your favor and you can apply it to certain things. You know, I mean, if I was mm -hmm. more disciplined Absolutely. with my eating, I wouldn't have to worry about weight <laughs> as much as I do. But disciplined in your spiritual life, to me, that's key because life is so unpredictable. And I'm thinking like crisis now because I've been through a few in the last six months. And if it were not for a disciplined spiritual life in terms of discipline in my practices, I wouldn't have been able to come through things so easily, I don't think. So, so. Oh yeah, well, that's one of the things that I say a lot is practice yes. makes practice. And if the only time that someone is doing a prayer is a foxhole prayer when there's an emergency, and they're trying to do all of their spiritual life then, it's not going to be nearly as helpful or probably as effective as if they have an ongoing spiritual practice and they build up some muscle memory so that when they realize, oh my gosh, I got to take this to prayer, they know how to do it. That matters, you know, because if you can't find your keys, it's not a crisis. I mean, unless you're late for work. <laughs> and, you know, I don't want to take it lightly. But there are some situations that you don't see it coming. And if you have a prayer practice or a spiritual discipline in place, you can lean on that. You can call on those principles that are sort of next second nature. You know, it doesn't change the situation, but it certainly can help guide you through the situation. Yeah, well, such is the nature of surprises that we don't expect them. And if we were expecting them, we would not call them surprises. Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah. So if we want to be ready for some surprise event to happen, then we want to prepare for whatever that practice yeah, is. Yeah. And, you know, I was, as you were speaking, surprises come good and less good. Well, definitely preferable yeah. and undesirable. And you have no trouble with the good surprises because then you immediately are grateful, thankful, happy, joyous, all of that, because it just comes like that. But the other side, I think it would be wise to be equally as prepared. We don't want to say, well, what if this happens? What is, if that happens? You know, like calling stuff into your space, but recognizing that there are surprises that are unwanted. And then you need to be able to shift into the gear that helps in that situation. Absolutely. I had an experience this morning got a call from my daughter. She needed to go to a meeting in New Hope. And there was a problem with the car. The battery was dead. Somebody had left a light on last night, so she needed to jumpstart. And of course, you know, I'm dad. I went over and we jumpstarted her car. And I was 
comfortable knowing that the battery would charge itself back up and everything would be well and she'd go off and have her meeting. Metaphysically speaking, when somebody buys jumper cables, are they planning on having a problem with their battery? Or are they being pragmatic and practical and understanding how things work in the world and knowing that I'm the sort of person who, when jumper cables are needed, I want to know where they are and I want to have quick access to them instead of letting that surprise come along and turn into an emergency. One of the most challenging things in new thought spiritual communities and organizations is we get people who are practitioners, who are very highly trained in doing healing prayer for other people, and they're working in consciousness all the time to be inviting the experience of life that they're desiring. And they get onto the board of trustees of the organization, and the board has to buy insurance. Well, as a practitioner, what are you insuring against? As a practitioner, you know, we don't need insurance. We are going to be completely responsible for our activities, and we don't need liability insurance because nothing like that's going to happen. But we have liability insurance anyway, because that's what we do in the world. Also, as a collective, in a new thought center, you have people at varying levels of consciousness. And mm -hmm. you can't say, because one person is at a very high and secure level in their life, maybe they do feel that they have control and can, and let's say they do. But in a group, a collective group, you can't say that. You can't bring that vibration, that consciousness up to the level where you don't need insurance. That's not going to work. And it is completely possible that there's a bigger story going on and something else to look out for that someone in the group of very high consciousness has a lesson about being supported that they need to learn. And it's going to involve slipping and having an accident in the kitchen. And from that, they will learn to be supported and cared for, etc. And by the way, if there's some funds that are going to be required, it's nice that the organization can provide those through the insurance. So we don't know what the whole big picture is. So if as a responsible organization, we're supposed to have jumper cables, get the jumper cables, get the insurance, render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's and render unto God that which is God's. And you need to pay sales tax, yes. then just pay it. Like warranties on stuff you buy. I was thinking about that when you were talking about what might happen in the kitchen or something. You know, you buy appliances and they want to tack on $150 for the warranties and sometimes even more. And I used to be opposed to that. You know, so by the time it breaks down, I'll just take that money and buy another one. But I don't know, after a while, I started thinking these things are going, you can count on them breaking, you know, pretty much. Mm -hmm. Just And yep. now I don't even think, you know, when they say they're trying to sell the warranty, I'm saying, listen, just put it on there. You don't have to sell me. <laughs> just whatever it is, just put it on. You want it for three years or five? Five. Yep. I want it for five. <laughs> yeah. Want it for five, because then you don't have to think about five it anymore. Five years, five. I'm tired of it anyway. I got to buy a new one, but at least I know. <laughs> <laughs> it will probably work that long. And I love this conversation because it is a deeply spiritual topic, and we're talking about everything other than spirituality. And that is, to me, the entire point. Because when we get into that spiritual practice and we can see the metaphor, we can see the alignment between what's going on in our spiritual world and what's going on in our day-to-day -day life, it becomes so much easier to just flow between them rather than have to wonder, oh, what's the lesson in metaphysics? Can I do that? Should I not do that? Or whatever it happens to be. So your discipline of being in that spiritual place, is like, yeah, just sign me up for the warranty. You know, sometimes when you're talking, there are other dynamics that are in place. Like you said, there's somebody else that needs a lesson or needs to learn a lesson about something else. Like in a group of people, there are so many dynamics going on. You can't count. You can't be aware of everything. Not just people, but circumstances around you. Take the best option that you have and go with that. Jim Rome says, you are the average of the five people around whom you spend the most time. And, hmm. you know, that hit me like a ton of bricks one day. When I read that, I was like, <laughs> oh, my. the first thing I thought of was, okay, who is it? And then, okay, so that was years ago I read it. Guess what? I read it again during the pandemic. <laughs> I'm like, okay. I got to figure, I need some leveling up here. So, 
<laughs> so I went on YouTube, right? <laughs> we get some of the spiritual masters and teachers and all of that. I said, that counts because you're around me, right? It's the same thing in the group of whatever it is that you're involved in. They're dynamics that are not where you are. And you need to ensure yourself, whatever that means, however that is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's who you're going to surround yourself with, what it is that you're going to be doing, and what the orientation is. And I was in the Boy Scouts when I grew up, and the motto of the Boy Scouts is be prepared. And they had all these merit badges. So you can learn water safety, and you can learn first aid, and you can learn orienteering, which is how to find your, your way out of the mountains or the forest with a compass. And I did all those things. I got the merit badges and I learned how to do those things. And it's not because I felt like being lost in the woods. It's because if I ever got myself lost in the woods, I'd really like to have a technique available. It's not because I wanted to go and find lots of people who are bleeding so that I could apply direct pressure. I don't need that. When I took up scuba diving, I learned dive rescue. So in the circumstance that somebody was in trouble and I was able to help, I could not only help them, but I knew what to do to keep myself safe while I was doing it. And that's the same sort of thing that we're doing when we are continuing with our spiritual practice. If I am aware on a regular daily basis that there's one infinite creative power that creates everything, that divine presence that is the source and substance and creator of all that exists, and it has created me, and I am an expression of that one, and I have that connection with that divine power, and I can use it to create the next new experience in my life, and I get to use the way that I claim it is by claiming what it is that I want. So instead of, I want this pain to go away, I know that I'm returning to comfort and harmony and alignment and peace of mind immediately. And so when I know what the structure is and I'm doing that all the time, then when something comes up, I can yeah. turn to it. Yeah, and it's important. Now, I had in making this shift from traditional to new thought, as you know, I had some real struggles with the steps because like 30 years, you're doing it differently, right? And mm -hmm. even more than 30 years, right? <laughs> Before that, you're doing it one way. But this way, I would say to myself, okay, look, you're disciplined anyway. So just put the five steps in your head and learn. <laughs> and learn the <laughs> now, you listen, it's about leadership. You know, with me, I guess because I was always put in the position of leadership. But everybody, like, I think his name's William Henley that wrote that poem. You know, you're the captain of your own ship. So whether you're leading a church or the head of a household or whatever, you're the head of your own life. And it's important to have those safety things in place. Like you said, if something happens, you want to be able to lead yourself out of it. You know, if it, not other people lead yourself mm -hmm. out of it. And I take that seriously, you know, of course. And listen, this is the control freak laying a card down. I'm not being a, <laughs> I'm laying it down, but I'm ever aware that you need to be able to have your skills sharp if you need them, I think. Exactly. Let's take a break. When we come back, we will talk about victim consciousness and wow. transcending it. Good. I can't wait. Get inspiration in an instant. God Calls are the gentle and uplifting moment of truth to help you remember that the bright light of God's love is shining right now as you. It's your God Call with Reverend Bill. Start your two-week free trial today and you'll get a phone call four times a week from Reverend Bill with an uplifting half-minute message filled with insight, wisdom, story, and fun. Let your light shine. You can answer the call to listen to it live or let it go to voicemail so you can hear it later. After the free trial, your subscription is just $5.95 a month. The details are at godcall.org. God calls are disruptive, intentionally. Whenever you write something, put on a gold star. They take you away from your routine to remind you about the truth of who you really are. They come at random times between 8.15 a.m. and 6 p.m., so you won't be expecting them. And somehow, the message is exactly what you need to hear at the time. Magic is loose in the world. It's a moment of motivation in the middle of your day. Find out more and start your two-week free trial now.
Welcome back to the Practical Prayer Podcast. I'm Carol Lawrence here with Reverend Dr. Bill Marcioni. We're going to talk about victim consciousness. Victim consciousness and transcending victim consciousness. Now, when we're living our life in the world, we are basically susceptible to victim consciousness. And victim consciousness is, it's done unto me. And we say that all the time. And we tack on, it's done to me as I believe. It's done unto us as we believe. It's done unto you as you believe. And it's done unto me. So whatever's going on in my life, it's being done to me. And when I need to deal with something, I react to it at the level of the world around me. So the car battery's dead. I need to get the jumper cables and restart it. And I need to buy the warranty and take care of things. And that's how we work in the world. When we get into a spiritual practice, we can up-level ourselves. When we are identifying that that infinite creative power that creates everything has created us and we have access to that power, we can use that same creative power ourselves, we elevate to manifest our consciousness because we know that it is our beliefs and we can change our beliefs, we can change our thoughts, we can use this practical prayer technique to create something new in our lives. And that brings us into manifest our consciousness, which is so, so much more powerful than victim consciousness. Now, it's not like when somebody makes the switch or when they learn that technique that they're suddenly never in victim consciousness again and they're just, they're manifestors that we slip back and forth all the time because we forget and then something happens and then we realize, oh, I need to take this to prayer and it's a back and forth. And that's not the end of it. The notion is that beyond manifestor consciousness where it's done by me is what we call channel consciousness, where instead of just doing stuff for myself, I can create a field of good and uplift and harmony for the people around me. I can make the circumstances of life and experience for lots of people be better. So I'm giving back and it's using that same technique of being open to spirit, but instead of just being about me, it's now about a larger, broader group. And that's channel consciousness. It's done through me. And then the top one is enlightenment. It's done as me. When we are so completely identified with the first two steps of the prayer that we understand that that divine power and presence is us and everything that's going on in our experience is the infinite flowing through us, then we're in being consciousness. It's done as me. And for me, that's a very fleeting peak experience. And it's really easy to slip back and forth between all of the stages. I have found myself flipping back and forth between channel consciousness, manifestor consciousness, victim consciousness in a matter of minutes. Something can happen, drags me right back down into victim consciousness. Now I need to transcend mm -hmm. this and mm -hmm. step up. And by the way, manifestor consciousness, which is really powerful and it's oh so cool because that's where we step up from victim consciousness. When we learn that we have this ability to create new experiences in our lives. If we stay there, then People say that new thought and practical prayer and this creating your experience is spirituality and the key of me because it's all about getting stuff that I want. And a lot of people have turned it into prosperity practices. And that's where the self-help people do. They take people, their students and their followers from victim consciousness to manifest their consciousness. And it's life in the key of me. The idea of getting beyond that is now it's life in the key of we, and it's back into being in the community rather than just getting the goodies for ourselves. I know exactly. I'm like following you exactly because it seems like I have all that around me, you know, with... <laughs> Maybe... <laughs> you mean a bouncing not back and me, forth? but... And I know I bounce back and forth. I hope... I'm not sure I like bounce, I like slide, but... <laughs> but I see it. Gr yes, gracefully that's, pirouette. <laughs> yes. Like, <laughs> Lawrence, you know, are you being the victim here? Like, stop right away and, you know, check yourself. But it's important because we're not in the world alone. And I think that's a big transition from traditional to new thought. There's the me, it's I have to do and I have to set goals and objectives and I must accomplish. But then when it becomes we, one mind, we're all together. In my opinion, you need this. You need the discipline. You need to be able to, you just can't be selfish. You know, it's just everything that I do affects somebody else, you know, like almost immediately. I was reading about auras and it talked about the distance of your aura, you know, 
from your body. It could be an inch. It could be whatever, whatever. And before the pandemic, I'm often in crowds of people, often. I'm kind of glad I didn't know about this then, right? Because... <laughs> Because it was saying that when you walk into a room, right, these auras are at different levels. Everybody's different. And you become part of the whole thing. So auras are touching and mingling. And if you can't perceive it that way, think about breathing. You know, everybody's breathing in the same air and breathing out. So, you know, we are mm -hmm. so connected that it only makes sense to think of it in the we. You know, it only makes sense because you're going to keep on bumping into situations that where you're affected and there's other people there. You know, one of the hardest things for me, not just new thought, but anything is as a leader, it's easier to do it yourself and get it done than to try to get five people to agree. <laughs> <laughs> and then when you go, you come to the next meeting and it's like you never had the first one, you know, just do it yourself and get it done. But then others aren't on board. They're not invested. And that's just like a superficial example of what, you know, being in oneness with everybody is like. And it's not urgent yeah. to be, because yeah. you know, I'm one of those, listen, let's get this done so we can move on to the next thing. It doesn't always work like that. It's a little slow. It can be. It can be. But that's okay, right? Because everything happens when it's supposed to. Yeah. Well, one of the blessings and curses of my life is that I tend to be very good at seeing three or four different things going on, and I understand how they fit together. And that's really powerful to be able to do that. And not everybody can. So I see three or four things going on. I say, oh, this is what it is. And I sometimes have to argue for sometimes for years of people saying that's not what it is. It's like, okay. And I have learned to back off and to be gentle and to understand they're moving at their own pace. And if in fact I was correct, either they'll eventually know that that's what's going on or it will turn out not to matter. It's also possible that I was wrong. That happens every once in a while, but it's still a pretty consistent knack that I have for doing that. So the question responding to what you're talking about, about leadership, is when we get into that group, when we are merging our auras or our energy fields or our intentionality, who are we? And if we don't agree on who we are, then there's going to be excitement. Perhaps when people complain that you're too disciplined, it's because you come in with the assumption that everybody's going to be that disciplined and maybe they don't want to. And if they're going to hang around with you, then there's too much <laughs> discipline and it's much easier to get you to stop than for them to pick up the baton. And oh, by the way, she's so disciplined that if I say we should do this sort of thing and it, yes, I will help and I'll get it taken care of. She's going to do it herself anyway, because she doesn't want to wait for me. Mm, yeah, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I just believe that you're right. I'll come to a situation with the assumption that we are on the same page. You know, if you're on the committee and you volunteered, then apparently in, you have an intention, you understand where this is going. So then let's just go. I'm not good at this right. arguing stuff. You know, like, what is the goal here? That's what it is. What's the goal? We're on the same page. We are all whatever we are. I'm avoiding putting labels on it, but we are whatever we are. And this is what it will take. So now let's move. Okay, let's just do this. Uh-huh. <laughs> in the actual meeting agenda, there's the section called old business. And what you're talking about is stuff that gets left in old business for meeting after meeting after meeting after meeting. Can we please I deal thought with this business you know, and have it be historical business? Yeah. Let's put this into the history book. Completely understand. And if there are five people involved, you can do the work of five people. If it's a committee and just get it taken care of. And if it turns out to be 500 or 5,000, then you can't. And at some point, being a leader is much more about the followers than it mm -hmm. is about the leader. Let's take a break and then do a foxhole prayer and translate. Oh, that's going to be interesting. A fox. <laughs> <laughs> a, a practical we'll talk a foxhole, foxhole prayer first. That works. Yeah. For real results. Let's see what happens. Okay. Mm hmm. Learn to put practical prayer to work in your life. The steps are simple to learn, 
and let you begin to get real results to create the life of your dreams immediately. Reverend Bill Marcioni's widely acclaimed book, Practical Prayer for Real Results, gives you a clear summary of the new thought principles behind practical prayer and the series of easy-to-understand steps found in the most effective prayers from religions and spiritual practices all over the world and throughout history. Practical prayer is not a replacement for your religion or practice. It's a technique to make the work you do in consciousness even more effective. The book includes 40 prayers on various topics that you can adapt as needed and use as your own. Practical Prayer for Real Results is available in paperback, Kindle, and audiobook on Amazon or at b-the-light.com. That's b-the-light.com. Welcome back to the Practical Prayer Podcast. I'm Carol Lawrence, your Reverend Dr. Bill Marcioni. We're going to do this practical prayer foxhole thing. Yeah, a foxhole prayer that we're going to turn into a practical prayer. And my favorite example of a foxhole prayer, and if it's not a familiar term, it's when the shooting starts and you jump into a hole and it's that close to utter demise because you got to stay out of the line of fire. The foxhole prayer is generally things like, God, if you get me out of this, I promise I'll go to church every Sunday, or God, please help me, or something plaintive like that. And that's a whole category of prayers. So my favorite example is, oh God, please don't let them take my house. That is very clearly a foxhole prayer. Oh God, please don't let them take my house. And it's very powerful. Oh God, please. And you can say that with passion and out loud, and you can scream, you can wail it. And the more you wail, the more powerful it seems. Oh, God, please don't let them take my house. And we know what we're looking for. Because obviously there is a challenge with the house or the finances or something that had been a structure that's in the process of collapsing. And the prayer is for some external God. Oh, God, out there, please, I'm just asking you that this is a favor. Don't. So we're asking for what we don't want. Don't let them. Who are they? We have no idea who they are and take my house. So the prayer is actually about taking my house. Well, first of all, there's a circumstance that led to the house being taken away and whoever is going to be doing the taking. Is it a moving company, a construction company that's going to demolish the house because there's a freeway bypass coming through and that's where they're taking the house? Is it the bank that's foreclosing on the house? Is it the landlord who says you got to move out of the house? Are the circumstances that The person can't afford the house. They made a a bad decision to buy a McMansion and became overextended. And there is financial challenges. And the reason that the house is going away is because the finances can't support the house. Well, do they want to continue with the financial struggle? Do they want to live in a house that's inappropriate and unacceptable for them or unsafe? Oh God, please don't let them take my house. It's about taking all of that stuff and ignoring it. But if this is about the house, is it the physical structure of the building? Is it about having a deed or a lease? Or is it about home? Is that about being in a comfortable place where I can live? So let's go with the notion that it's about, this is my home and I don't want to lose my home. And if it's got financial consequences, I don't want to have the financial consequences either. So that turns into, I want to live in my comfortable home in a way that is viable for my lifestyle and my finances. So I want to be in alignment in that way. So the prayer then turns into, I am living in my perfect home. And instead of being to God out there, the prayer turns into an affirmation that I'm living in my perfect, comfortable home and I can afford it. And I have plenty of money to support my lifestyle. And instead of, Oh God, please don't let them. It's, Oh God, divine presence within, I know that I have my perfect, comfortable home and I'm living in it with ease and joy and grace and prosperity. And that's, that has much less energy than, oh God, please don't let them take my house. And it's not the sort of thing you can yell. And if you do yell it, it gets less effective the louder you yell because the power isn't in the yelling. The power is in the divine presence that's flowing through that. 
And that's the process of switching from a foxhole prayer into an affirmative prayer or practical prayer is because we are looking at what we want and we get ourselves, the more we get into that, the technique of the first and second step, the first step is recognition, recognizing that God is all there is, that that divinity is everything. One creative power that created all of it. And the second step is unification where we are acknowledging and recognizing that that divine power and presence, that infinite creative power created me and it created me out of itself. There was nothing but the infinite and it's created me. That divine presence is me right here, right now. And I have access to that same creative power that created everything. And then the game's on because we then go into the creative part where we're going to do that affirmation of for what we want, powerful, positive, personal, and present tense. It's going to be happening now. It's what we want to be happening. It's going to have some powerful language. It's not going to be wishy-washy. And then we step into gratitude for all the good that's already unfolding and we release it. We let it go. We let that infinite creative power that creates galaxies create this. And the process is where the power is rather than how loud we shout the prayer. So the practical prayer that we're going to do is for highest and best unfolding with love and ease for each of us and all of us. And that works in every area of our lives. That works when we're talking about our health and our feelings of vitality and physical comfort, because that infinite creative power can certainly create an experience of health or harmony or fitness or anything else in our physical experience. It can deal with our prosperity. One of the, my favorite things to do in our introductory class is we do the unexpected income club. We were talking about surprises before, and that's always about surprises because unexpected income is a surprise. Every time it's a surprise and we can just open ourselves and invite the surprise. Where's the money coming from? I don't know. I wasn't expecting it. It can happen in our relationships, whether it's with our beloved or with our kids or with our extended family or in our workplace, our neighborhood. We can have more love unfolding in our experience and feel that love even more deeply. It can be about our creative expression, the way that we're sharing ourselves and our work in the world. It can be about our deepening spiritual awareness. It can be about any area of our life. And I'm going to shorthand it into this new thought, practical foxhole prayer. <laughs> All that. You're going to put shorthand. Yeah. And the phrase that I'm going to use for that is highest and best unfolding with love and ease. And everybody who's listening can have their own take on whatever highest and best is. But we know that it's, we're looking at the good stuff. That's the positive part of our affirmation. So if you're listening to this and you have something specific in mind that has your attention, then go ahead and identify that as the area in your life, which is getting higher and better. As we continue in the awareness that there is this one infinite creative power, this one divine love, God itself sharing itself as and in and through all of its creation, everything is that divine presence shared in its own specific and particular way. There is only God. And so that divine God presence is right here, right now. It is me. It is present as me, in me, through me. It is present as and in and through each one who is listening to this prayer. We are individualizations, personalizations, particularizations of the one. All that we are is that divine presence taking a specific form in a time, in a place, in a shape, in a combination of skills, talents, gifts, aptitudes, desires that are unique to us. So each unique and each of us in our own way, exactly the same. And so that infinite creative power that creates everything that is us is creating this next new experience of our life. And we invite it in on behalf of each one listening. I invite in that next new experience, the highest and best version of it possible unfolding with love and ease for all of us, for everyone involved. There is no struggle required whatsoever. There is simply the opportunity for love to unfold, for good, as we describe it, to reveal itself even more richly and fully and deeply in our lives. This good is underway now, highest and best unfolding with love and ease for each of us and all of us. With the richness and the sweetness and the joy and the harmony and the comfort, the creativity, the wisdom, the guidance, all of the good that we could possibly imagine pressed down and overflowing. This good is unfolding now, our highest and best, unfolding with love and ease. 
And I'm so grateful for it. I'm grateful for the wonderful way that it's coming about. I'm grateful for the transformation in awareness as we are understanding the good that's coming to our lives and also the process that this is uplifting everyone who's listening to this with an even deeper awareness that this process works and that the spiritual practice is worth practicing. And so with gratitude for all of the good that's unfolding, gratitude for the awareness of this creative process, and gratitude for the ability to speak this word of intention and release it into that law, I let it go. I know it's so. And so it is. And so it is. That was great. As usual. I'm looking forward to hearing some stories. Practical Prayer Podcast with Reverend Bill Marcioni and Carol Lawrence is a production of BeTheLight.com. Be-the-light.com. Where you can find more information about practical prayer for real results. Our theme is by Music of Wisdom. You can learn about the spiritual community of New Thought Philadelphia with daily guided meditations, weekly celebrations of spirit, and Reverend Bill's classes in practical spirituality at NewThoughtPhilly.org.